Greetings and welcome to This Is Revolution. My name is Jean Bagelin, in for Jason Mars today for this uh, pre-record. And we've got a really exciting topic and guest for you all today. We'll be discussing uh, Heinrich Grossman, the economist and Marxist theorist with Ted Reese, who is an you know expert on this subject. It's a pretty, uh, uh, or it has been a pretty obscure uh part of Marxism in the past. And so it's a, you know, an interesting topic that we're going to be tackling today. But before we begin, I would like to remind people to like and subscri subscribe to the channel. Uh, likes and subscribing really helps us uh, get up in the algorithm, helps build TIR up. And of course, if you have the means, it would be fantastic if you could consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, that keeps the lights on. It keeps Jason in internet. And so keeps TIR rolling on. Uh, so, and of course, with Patreon, you do get the extra content, including the notorious champagne room. And finally, I should probably mention that on the 23rd of October uh, in LA, there will be a live show featuring TIR, Ben Burgess, and uh, the left reckoning crew. So if you're in the LA area, do consider going along to that show. The link to the tickets are in the description and, you know, there's going to be loads of people there, including, you know, everybody's favorite angry leftist, C. Derek Vaughn, uh, Daniel Bessner, Nando Villa, a bunch of other people. So it should be, should be a great time for everybody. And without further ado, then I will continue uh, with the show and bring on, of course, uh, the leading intellectual light of This Is Revolution, our commander in chief, the one, the only, Pascal Robert. Hey, Pascal, how are you doing? Peace and greetings to Eugene. Peace and greetings to the audience in the chat. Uh, look forward, looking forward to this interview. Uh, from, I did the reading, you know, familiar with the uh, subject matter, so this is going to be an interesting one. How are things going with you in? Uh, Missouri. Well, you know, because it's a pre-record, I'm feeling very fresh because we're recording it in the daytime as opposed to like after I've had to keep the, ch you know, put the children to bed, feed the children, you know, right. sm smash the patriarchy through personal action. That makes me very tired before the show. There you go. But no, yeah. I'm all, I'm all hopped up on coffee, ready to go, ready to rumble, ready to get to this, uh, get to this topic. So our guest is Ted Reese. He's a, a socialist, a theoretician, and a writer. He's recently published a book with zero books on uh, Heinrich Go Grossman and the end, end of capitalism. He also published an article in uh, Sublation Magazine, which is kind of a shorter introduction to that topic, which I think pe you know people who don't know much about the topic uh, about Heinrich Grossman or his theories, they might want to start with that Sublation uh, magazine article because I think it gives a kind of good summation, very tidy summation of some of the core ideas. So I'm going to bring Ted on and welcome to the show, Ted. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks very much for having me on. Thanks for agreeing to come on. So um, we might as well get down to brass tech. So Pascal, mm. uh, Absolutely. open up. Ted, can you go into some background on uh, Heinrich Grossman for us? Uh, who and where was he in the historical context of where, uh, where he was operating in terms of Marxist thought? And overall American, uh, not, not American, but Western political and economic thought comprehensively. Okay, so he was born in Galicia in Poland, uh, which was the Austrian occupied part of Poland. Uh, it was partitioned at the time and um, he got into uh, revolutionary politics at around the age of 15. Main, I mean, he was quite, he, he was from a well-off family, but he was against the occupation and he was also Jewish um, and he was particularly motivated by the mistreatment of um, Jewish workers and Jews in general in, in Poland. Uh, and also not just by the ruling class, but by the, the sort of reformist left who had a kind of assimilationist view of uh, on the Jew on on Jewish liberation, whereas he was more interested in the day. I mean, he saw that as a sort of as a long term thing, but he, he was also 
convinced that to attract Jewish people to the struggle, you had to, you know, be, um, you know, advocating for their their rights in the here and now, <coughs> on the on a you know in their daily struggles as well. So he ends up. So he was part of the Social Democratic Party in Poland. Um, but he ended up splitting from it and forming a, an independent Jewish party. Um, after the struggles of the first, after, after First World War had died down, after the Russian Revolution, but after the uh, and then after the period where the other revolutionary upsurges in, across Europe had faded, he um, he he moved into academics. Um, and he became a expert in statistics and then he wrote he you, you know he, he he claims later on that he quickly mastered the the marxist literature at a young age um so he was obviously very confident and um i mean he, to be fair he backs it up i think um and yeah in 1929 um on the eve of the um wall street crash he publishes his book, um, The Law of Accumulation and the Breakdown of the Capitalist System. Um, Talk about British timing. Yeah. And no one else in, on the Marxist left um, was, say, was saying that a major crisis in, in America is brewing. Um, his book says this. He doesn't say that we're about to enter the Great Depression exactly, but he says, you know, a massive over accumulation of, of capital is uh, hitting the US economy. And he says it's going to ruin its European debtors. And, um, you know, and, and he based that on the activity on the stock market, because he could see that capitalists were channeling, you know, all their funds into the stock market, because the the profitable opportunities in in production were were, were dissipating. So that was the real that was why he that was the basic reason he was able to predict the the great depression or the wall street crash when the likes of kowski were saying capitalism has never been stronger than it is right now so he basically began as a political activist and a revolutionary but after the uh, first world war he moved more into academic circles. And if I'm not uh, incorrect, he, uh, he was associated with the Frankfurt School, uh, the first generation of Frankfurt School thinkers. Was he connected with any political party at the time? Was he connected with the Communist Party in Germany or the independent Social Democrats or the Social Democrats? Or had he kind of just totally just entered this uh, field of academic research by, by the 1920s? Sorry, I missed out a bit there. So he moved to Austria after the First World War, and then he moved back to Poland um, in the t later in the twenties and joined the Polish Communist Party, mm -hmm. which was um, associated with the Communist International, um, which was based in Moscow. So he was one of the leading intellectual figures of, of the Polish Party. But he was arrested several times for his activity. Um, one stretch um, in jail was for about eight months, I think. And then he was eventually um, forced to leave the country. Um, and he was allowed to stay in Germany um, on the basis that he didn't join any parties. So he joined the Frankfurt School. And, mm. and when he published his book, I think I'm right in saying it was the most read publication that came out of the Frankfurt School, which is interesting because they didn't do, you know, they did a lot on philosophy and culture, obviously. Um, but but his book was the most read, probably because it was the most controversial. That's that's interesting because, of course, today we associate the Frankfurt School almost exclusively with this sort of cultural orientated uh, critiques that it forwards. Grossman's economic theory and his participation in the Frankfurt School, despite its relevance at the time, has to a certain degree faded uh, into obscurity, which is, a, you know, interesting. I actually wanted to ask you about that. Would you, do you think that Grossman would have continued his affiliation 
with the Frankfurt School had he had lived past 1950? Um, no, no. I mean, he'd already been sacked from the Frankfurt School by then. By, by I can't remember exactly when it is, but during World War II, I think he is sacked by Horkheimer, who had replaced the initial um, leader of the Frankfurt School, who was uh, Grum Grumberg, I can't remember his first name, sorry, um, who, who Grossman had worked with in Austria. Um, and Horkheimer, so Horkheimer and Adorno sort of drifted to the right and decided the working class wasn't revolutionary. Right. Um, the worst, the worst conditions got basically. That that was the tra trajectory they took. Even you know, and Grossman liked some of Horkheimer's work, uh, some of his philosophical work. Um, although he did, you know, have a go at him quite, you know, occasionally because he wasn't doing enough activism or he wasn't, you know, um, militant enough in his in his um, in his calls for action and, and that sort of thing. Um, but Grossman, at the end of World War II, moves back to Germany and starts teaching in East Germany and started to teach um, <coughs> e e Marxist economics, um, but not in Berlin. I think it was in Leipzig. And um, he started to get a bit more recognition during that time, but he was never promoted by the Communist International mm. um, as, you know, this leading... Marxist thinker on on economics or anything else, which is a big shame because it you know his obscurity wouldn't have been what it is if the Soviet Union or the Comintern um, or even just you know socialist East Germany on its own had had promoted his work. Um, that's a big reason why he, he's remained fairly obscure. But as I argue, he's the best defender of of Marx Marx's economic work and Marx's capital. Well, let's move on to that uh, question then. So in what way uh, does Grossman seek to continue or to confirm uh, the work of Marx? And sort of as an addendum to that question, how was his uh, theories, how were they received by the socialists in Germany and in the, so uh, and the Soviet Union at the time? So, you know, what, what, was his, what was his project? What was his intellectual project as an economist? You know, how did he come to predict the the Wall Street crash, and what you know, what were the implications of all this? So he, you know, he was inspired to write because he felt that no one else since Marx, or or even or at least since Engels, had covered Marx properly and accurately in terms of what Marx had expounded in Capital over the previous 30 years. So he's writing in um, 1929 and over the, over the pre, you know, essentially since the publication of volume three, um, he's complaining that no one had um, written or assessed Marx's methods that he's used in, in Capital or what he's trying to show in Capital, which is that Capitalism is in inherently crisis uh, prone, that it tends to break down in terms of its production um, and that it must eventually lead to a, a revolutionary situation that compels a, a struggle for, for socialism. And so, so the, the, the thing that really he, he gets at in his complaints and critiques of the other socialists. So he's talking about, um, he's talking about social Democrats mainly um, in terms of the likes of Otto Bauer and Kautsky um, and Hilferding. Um, but he's also critiqued Rosa Luxemburg um, uh, and Varga, sorry, trying to think of all the names, and and Bukharin, like ev everyone, really, no no one has done a um, a comprehensive and accurate take on on capital as far as Grossman's concerned. And the mistake that pretty much all of them made was to 
stop at the end of volume two and treat the the abstractions that Marx had made in the um, second volume as as if he was describing empirical reality. So his his abstractions were treated as his conclusions. Uh, even Lux, even Luxembourg does this, even though she does uh, carry a breakdown theory. But her theory is that capitalism runs out of um, non-capitalist countries to export um, commodities to, or export capital and commodities to. So the so her theory is the the world will capitalism will run out of of world to industrialize, and then the system will break down. <coughs> Or, or at least it will tend to break down more and more the closer we get to that point. Whereas his argument is that once you go leave the abstractions behind and treat them as abstractions that, that they were in Marx's method, and then approach empirical reality via Marx's uh, method of successive approximation. So he, he starts with the abstractions. He has a, a kind of like a pure version of capitalism where you know to simplify it for the for you know the the purpose of theoretical insight and getting at the essence of the system he has he starts with just two classes so like a whole or a singular capitalist class without competition and a work, a productive commodity producing working class so those are the only two classes so what you he, he has a kind of almost like Aristotelian kind of ideal type of capitalism that he uses, you know, as a as a tool. But yeah. what you're saying is subsequent theoreticians were taking his uh, sort of idealization and his like kind of pure uh, abstract form of capitalism and acting as if that is the uh, a concrete description of reality. But you, uh, uh, the contention of Grossman was that Marx's just laying out tools to be used to uh, look at a reality. He's, the tools are not the reality themselves. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, he um, they uh, they end up when when they do their own uh, schemas in in their books, like Otto Bauer's is the famous one that that Grossman critiques. He's only doing a value schema. He doesn't then come back to like the prices of production um for example and he doesn't reintroduce certain elements that were um uh, that were discarded from the original um schema so you know grossman gets accused of being mechanistic but it's actually the people he's critiquing who are being mechanistic because Correct. they're one of, the, one of the critiques that grossman has of mm. the traditional marxist who are using Marxists that they have reduced themselves to being a certain kind of vulgar Marxist, if you will, and that they're they're not taking in some of the more nuanced aspects of Marxist thought, particularly when it comes to his rate of uh, or diminishing return of profitability over time, which is something I wanted to ask you about because it's something that it's very controversial for many people today who try to convince to defend Marx in the post seventies era with the rise of neoliberalism. When people are always ask, well, how can we actually defend Marx's critique that profit, the rate of profitability was always going to be declining if in the neoliberal period we see all of these massive corporations in their capacity to actually feed the world? Doesn't that tend to defeat the capacity of what Marx was trying to say that profitability, the rate of profitability declines over time? Yeah, so, um, I mean, Grossman has it like... Grossman has a general rule, but, but obviously that's an, when where he's abstracting, but obviously he comes back to the concrete where that's not always the case. But the general rule is that as capital tends to accumulate higher, the rate of profit tends to decline inversely. So, and then obviously in the real world, he comes back to the real world and shows that when it breaks down, like the rate of profit can actually go up because, you know, the the amount of capital accumulated has, has fallen in, in that scenario. Um, and obviously there are all sorts of reasons that the rate of profit can go up and down. Um, but the tendency and the, and the tendency is the law. Like the people say, people say to me, it's not a law, it's a tendency. But when you read Marx, he says that it's the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And he does also say that it's a Marx. <coughs> he, he says explicitly it's a tendency of the rate of profit to progressively fall 
over time. So, you know, if you look at there's studies, there's empirical studies now confirming this. Um, Esteban, Maito, Michael Roberts, those two in particular, and there's a few others have done pretty comprehensive studies showing that the rate of profit has tended to decline. Um, obviously, obviously not in a linear way, but it has overall, it's 10, I think in my ATO studies, it, the average of in the 1870s, the average rate of profit was 43%. And in the 2000s, it was 17%. And it's tended to fall in so, between those two periods. So so when we talk about uh, uh, falling the the ten, you know the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, um, it is a tendency because of course even in the work of Marx there are counter tendencies, but those counter tendencies yeah. can never entirely compensate for the overall trajectory of profit to fall. So in the short or even medium term, there may be mechanisms and opportunities through which capital can increase the rate of profit. But overall, if you take a long view since the beginning of the history of capitalism or since the 1870s, uh, that general tendency is a downward tendency. Would that be an accurate description of what we mean when we talk about the tendency uh, of the rate of profit to fall? So, for example, in the 80s, there may have been a bump in profitability in the short term for cer certain people. I don't know, you know the detailed economic statistics, but ultimately that fails to counter the overall broader historical trend. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the, 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 the thing, the biggest counter tendency during the neoliberal period has been the, the sort of technological revolutions that have, you know, it, it almost incre like in a sort of increasingly exponential way, expanded our productive capacity because obviously like the, I think, um, you know, economic output tends to double every 20 years. So when you keep doubling it every 20 years, you end up with eventually you you can start to see that exponential curve um, <clears throat> in terms of GDP and productive output, even though the the relative uh, productivity growth has slowed. Um, but yeah, that I think that's been the, the biggest counter tendency. And obviously that's a, a you know, that's a historical and technical thing um, mm -hmm. that was almost inevitable because we're always going to be evolving technology and our productive capacity. Um, but yeah, there's a the, Grossman actually outlines more counter tendencies. You know, it, it, this is the other thing. You know, you get you can't accuse him of being mechanistic because he he even outlines more counter tendencies than than Marx. He's what he's doing is describing and assessing a living natural process. That's what he's doing. Okay, he used math, he uses mathematics to do it, um, but you can't not do it without, without some mathematics. You can't stop and look at how much capital was over accumulated at a certain point in time, um, or how much wages have fallen. You know, you can't assess the system without doing that. Um, and if people want want to claim that's a mechanistic way of doing it, I don't I don't know how else you can do it. Obviously, maybe the technology uh, but the, exists today. But the end point that he postulates is like a definitive one. It's almost like a human life. You can extend your life by doing exercise. Yeah. You can eat right, but you're going to die one day or the other. So you know his the the end point is this breakdown and this crisis. Mm. So you know. Why is that? In, why can't capitalism, like you know, have a crisis and then reconstitute itself? Which, which well, is what it's done. Yeah, well, most of the time it can, and you know, during the during the um, time in history that it's able to do that, it's most of the time it has it has pretty much been able to. In fact, you could you could say that it has always eventually uh, been able to do that um because you know one one of the ways it did it was to destroy the soviet union so during the period where um in the 70s when um the captive system was in a massive crisis again one of the ways of overcoming that crisis was to destroy the soviet union and therefore bring 
all of the um, labor that was that was not being exploited in the Soviet Union, bringing it under a uh, capitalist system and therefore make expanding the the exploitable um labor base so you know that that ultimately is what uh grossman gets at is the um is that um to overcome each crisis capitalism needs to expand the late the exploitable labor base um because labor is the source of of profit so that you know exp the exploitation of commodity producing labor is the the source of profit so so grossman is upholding the the labor theory of value um and that that is his starting point you know and he, he goes from there so you, you you can look at all the counter tendencies that he talks about in terms of devaluing capital pushing down wages um, which he which he says happens anyway because as you expand production, you devalue commodities, and one of those commodities is labour power. Um, all of those things, but ultimately, the the way that capitalism usually overcomes a crisis is by expanding the um, exploitable labour base, um, and you know, as I say destroying the Soviet Union was one way of doing that, bringing large large pools of Chinese labor um, into the world capitalist economy was another way of doing it. Would you say um, imperialism? Would you say imperialism is another way as well? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, imperialism is both a natural development as um, as capital needs to carry on accumulating. And the reason, and Grossman's reason shows why it needs to keep accumulating it is a value producing system. So it, this is another thing that, that no one else did before him other than Marx was to, to say it's a dualistic system in that it's a valorization system. It's a system that has to create value to sustain itself and more value than before um, because of, because it's a profit-making system as well. And then on the other side, it's a technical labor process. And there hadn't been much assessment of, of the latter, that all the focus had been on, on the former. So he, you know, he dialectically um, works through both of those things. And um, that that had they hadn't been, no one else had been doing that. So and yeah, so to to when you get a crash, you get a collapse, you get a devaluation, a, a devalorization of capital, and then so the capitalists are then to to get investment going again, they need to um, re revalorize capital and beyond what it was before, um, and the monopolization of industry is one way of doing that. So um, you get you get you get an overaccumulation of capital, where the amount of capital um, relative to the amount of labour being exploited um, has there's too much of a disequilibrium between them. So the amount of labour being exploited and the amount of labour time or surplus labour time or surplus value, whichever you want to call it, there's there's an underproduction of that. And that also produces an over accumulation of capitals. There's not enough surplus value to valorize the total amount of existing capital, whether you're talking about individual capitals or the system as a whole. So it goes into crisis. Um, investment is pulled out because it's not profitable. That cre creates a devaluation of commodities, of capital, and then that cheapening of everything makes it affordable and profitable to start investing again um and th so the system gets going again on a higher level but one of the ways that they do that is to monopolize industry on an increase like on a every time like it gets more and more monopolized or tends to because that will you know you get the economies of scale from that which makes um production cheaper and more efficient um and that sort of thing so with that monopolization you end up with imperialism 
And so imperialism is both a counter tendency and a natural development of the system. Sorry, I really need to just close my blinds because this sun is just killing me. Can I, is, there, is that all right? Sure. Okay, Sorry. Hey, Sorry? Well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's totally fine. Just go sorry, ahead. Sorry, uh, sorry. The sun was getting into home. Yeah, it was getting very sunny there. I had to bring the baby in for a baby intermission because she wanted, she was just too upset. Looks like Ted is back. Oh, he's de-sunned himself. But yeah, it gets very sunny in England. One of the things people forget is the sun goes down extremely late in the UK. It's very bright. <laughs> Welcome back. Sorry about that. Ted, one of the things I actually wanted to ask you was about what was the kind of frustration that uh, that uh, Andre Grossman was experiencing when he saw the reaction to not only the crisis of capitalism as a result of the Depression, but also the post Bretton Woods kind of development of the Keynesian Fordist paradigm that came out of the West being used as a response to the crisis of capitalism because as we know as we sort of said earlier that one of the problems that we had with the frankfurt school was that they resigned themselves that the fortis keynesian keynesian model that gave so much material benefit to workers pacified them so extremely that they lost their revolutionary capacity were there any frustrations that the response to the crisis of capitalism that extended capitalism well into the 21st century uh, that were demonstrated by Grossman at all that showed that he was frustrated or he was found. How did he deal with these contradictions that were being brought forth by the uh, Keynesian economic planners? You know, I haven't read anything that he that he wrote on that but one of his pupils um if you if you can call him that um paul uh matic junior uh senior sorry um was one of the pro was probably the prime defender of grossman's economics and he he wrote on that period um and i've done some work on it as well and i've obviously others have as well i think the the key thing from 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 that period is to really explain that the state was used to save capitalism like so nationalizations okay they were victories of social democracy in in the reformist sense and they did improve the conditions of the working class but capital also needed those nationalizations at the time because it didn't it, the cost of um, the upfront cost of rebuilding entire civilizations after the World War II were really massive, and capital usually couldn't afford that. So um, the state took on that responsibility, took on those costs. Um, the other thing about that period, which is interesting, is sort of like the demand for labor was so high for the same reason. Um, you know, you'd had this massive devaluation of capital, which Grossman had written about in terms of war being uh, a counter tendency um, to to the to the breakdown tendency, because obviously war accelerates that um, devaluation that capital needs, and at a certain point it needs a very large amount of devaluation that the normal processes can't really deal with and so war becomes um almost inevitable because it pits imperialist like the competition because the like the underproduction of surplus value is becoming so acute the competition between the imperialists and, and other cap capitalist powers intensifies um so the recovery from world war ii yes there was there were those victories for of labor and of the reformist wing but they were also you know necessary developments uh, that were really based on that devaluation from two and then the resulting high demand for so, labor 
one of the questions I always have for all of us on the left who are always decrying the potential collapse or the eventual collapse of capitalism is that we're consistently seeing the resilience in the capitalist capacity to reform themselves, to maintain their economic salience. How can we forecast an economic model or a political model that challenges that resilience to create a paradigm where we're creating an alternative instead of simply reacting to a collapse? Or is Grossman basically only saying that in the end, the 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 only revolutionary challenge will be the collapse of the system as opposed to human-based revolutionary challenge? So he relates the sort of the two like they're not separate he they dialectically interact and influence each other so i think you have to start with the breakdown like if the system doesn't break down is there going to be a revolution i think evidence is pretty clear that there isn't like if if the vast majority of people are you know um in 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 employment and doing you know and surviving you know, without going hungry, then I don't think people are going to risk the consequences of trying to overthrow capitalism. Um, you know, the reformists were always saying that the working class is going to capitalism for for moral, um, you know, because of the crimes of the capitalist class. But there's been a lot of crimes committed by the capitalist class, and that hasn't happened. Only that's only happened in a handful of you know um, exceptional. Ex uh, circumstances um what his theory of class struggle is that the the breakdown of the tendency for production to break down and investment to therefore um to be pulled back um at times in very extreme to very extreme degrees that compels the capitalist class to attack the working class so they the the class struggle starts there and then it's up to the working class to fight back. Now, obviously, we might debate about which sections of the working class are more likely to fight back or, you know, there's all sorts of questions on that front. But as a, you know, um, analysis of when and why, you know, essentially when a capitalist um, system might go into an extreme crisis that, that um, produces a ex more extreme response from the working class than all that we haven't seen before or something along those lines. I think, you know, I think the degree of the breakdown is what's going to, the degree of the breakdown and the intensity and scale of the attack is probably what's going, it probably is what's going to influence, I don't want to use the word determine or dictate because I'll get <laughs> I'll get a lot of stick, but um, that's the sort of thing that's going to influence like the degree and scale of the fight back from the working class. So at the moment, we're in, like in Britain, for example, we're already seeing like uh, a, a huge uptick in strike action that we haven't seen for a look for, for a very long time. And that reflects, you know, the, the state of British capitalism. It's in a much deeper crisis than it was 10 15 20 years ago so the attacks on the working class are that much more severe and the working class is starting to fight back so it's out of that struggle that communists and marxists who understand why this is really going on need to relate to those struggles get involved in them and try and bring workers who are fight, who are who've started to fight the system already because they've had to you know, try and bring them um, along, uh, you know, fight fighting side by side by, with them and try to bring them in the direction of why this is actually happening and what the ultimate resolution has to be um, if we're going to, you know, overcome um, these crises, which are, which are only going to get worse. I can't tell you if exactly when a final one is going to strike, but... If capitalism is to end, then um, there has to be a final one by definition. Um, obviously, that might not be a world revolution that happens all in in the midst of one global recession or anything like that. But that's the that's 
you know, uh, you know, for example, I think China is further behind in its crisis than Britain and the US and Europe. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a class struggle. It's definitely a human um, struggle um, led by humans and human action. So but it's compelled by the crisis that's inherent to the system. Just to clarify, because, you know, you've I, I know you uh, have been accused of being an economist and a mechanistic Marxist who sees uh, this is inevitable, inevitable. What your contention is, is then that the breakdown in capital capitalism is um, in a, there's, a, there's an inevitable economic breakdown in capitalism, which is a prerequisite for some kind of move towards socialism. Yeah. Uh, and these breakdowns are progressively deeper and more fundamental, but you still adhere to the notion that, you know, in order to, let's say, achieve socialism, to achieve a dictatorship of the proletariat move beyond the capitalist system, this requires not just, you know, uh, increased uh, militancy, but like, you know, an active agent uh, to direct that militancy. Otherwise, either capitalism will reconstitute itself or, you know, as, as Marx points out in, um, you know, communist manifesto you can end up with the common ruin of both the contending classes so if we have you know a global war that is the a, an outcome of you know a deep crisis in capitalism we could end up nuking each other and then we're like put back to the freaking medieval ages and feudalism again so you're not your 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 point is not that like there's a it's not like the old kind of like socialism is ever inevitable outcome of capitalism's crisis but rather that this crisis is a precondition but it that there is a uh, there is an element of uh agency in terms of how that crisis is exploited by the left yeah totally um that's a pretty good summary i mean what i would say is in terms of this argument about whether it's inevitable okay Socialism isn't inevitable because you could have nuclear annihilation, climate change could run away before we get the chance that. Um, so, so, like my first book is called Socialism or Extinction because those two things are definitely, you have to um, regard them as existential threats if we don't stopping them. And um, but in terms of like a natural, and I use the word natural because what Marx and Grossman are describing are natural processes of evolution. Like, is nature inevitable? Is evolution inevitable? It, like, obviously there's no linear evolution, but it, that doesn't mean it's not inevitable. Like evolution, one way or another, even those outcomes, if we even if we get those outcomes, that's still a form of evolution. And and evolution is, you know, evolution is like part random and part relational. It's not deterministic, but and like like I do use the word deterministic sometimes, but very loosely, and, and I'm gonna stop doing that. Um, but it's you know, the the previous movement in the Marxist dialectic in his assessment of of matter. You know, the previous movement is related, or sorry, the, the next movement is related to the previous movement. And the same is, you can see this in uh, Marxist schemas, in Grossman's schemas. So you can't have a serious assessment of capitalism without, nat uh, without um, appreciating that it is a natural process in the way that it works. Um, in the way that it accumulates capital necessarily, um, that the way that it inherently, again, naturally tends to break down and the way that it, you know, the essential ways in which it can recover itself to some extent. But I, I think in the in the book, I used the, the analogy of sort of like the system being a bit like a bodybuilder who's addicted to gain. Like at some point, you're going to get 
top heavy and or you you know the you can't put any more on you know sort of thing like the the amount of protein you need to consume is no longer enough you know to to grow your muscles even bigger and that's what going on with capital it's the you know, cap mark uh grossman says it's it the bigger it gets the harder it becomes to valorize because you've got to produce even more value than before but you've got to do it from a, a relatively dwindling pool of labor because of course one of the counter tendencies is innovation which will then create more capital relative to the amount of labor employed and so the system the, the the internal contradiction in the system um, just intensifies. My Does that answer that's, the question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think that's a that's a that's a, an important answer. Also, a, a subtle dig at the swallowtariat for uh, you know getting so big <laughs> with his muscle gain, <laughs> but. Um, well, you know, kind of as we're heading into the final 10 minutes, what I wanted to ask then is, you know, like a two-part question then. Why do you think uh, Grossman is not being picked up more today? Is it simply because people don't know about him? Or is there like a, is there, is, is there an ideological reason why people, uh, some elements of the left might reject his uh, political uh, and economic message? And in terms of his theories for today, do you think we're heading towards like a deep fundamental breakdown uh, in capitalism that may provide that opportunity uh, for us to, 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 to move beyond a capitalist system? Um, and, you know, what is going to be, what is facilitating that crisis? What's the, you know, what, what, what's, what's making this crisis in inevitable? Okay, so the, on the first one, I mean, there is a there is a labour aristocracy, you know, like a privileged layer of workers, who, you know, they they are also dependent on the state for their income, right? And so they see like the the best way forward for them is reforms and taking more of the economy and therefore jobs under state ownership but they don't th but they're not interested in a revolution that would get rid of you know all private property um would you say that's what uh, movements like sanders and corbyn represented in britain and the united states then yeah i mean don't get me wrong i think a lot of workers who aren't part of any sort of labor aristocracy followed them like with you know with optimism and hope and were encouraged by you know hearing things that were a lot better than what we usually hear from from politicians from mainstream politicians um but it's those a lot of you know a lot of their followers definitely need to be converted i'm, I'm not going to dismiss them as all labor aristocrats or or some of the worst terms we've used historically um in the communist movement I mean, um, in America, everybody talks about PMCs now. It's all about professional managerial class, which is yeah. kind of just labor aristocracy rebranded in many ways. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I think it's difficult because I've, I've been, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of parroting what Grossman and Lenin say about the labor aristocracy, but I'm not that fixated on it, to be honest, mm -hmm. because I see the whole thing as a process right so there's the process of proletarianization going on where people even you know even capitalists and not even just capitalists who we might regard as petty bourgeoisie or smaller capitalists are being proletarianized where their companies are going bust and they're therefore having to you know find uh um a way a job with a weight that pays a wage so and then th there will be people in the labor aristocracy who are seeing their bills rise and all this stuff right and you know the cost of <coughs> going up and it's getting harder to to essentially reproduce yourself and your family and so on and so forth and mm. um so yeah i'm definitely i don't and the fact that we haven't had um you know, a world revolution in the past can be solely 
explained by the labor aristocracy and i don't think we can can describe the labor aristocracy as some sort of fixed force mm -hmm. there that you know grossman says you can't just um you can't just like convert the working class into a revolutionary force by hammering the theory into their head they have to experience the class struggle like they have to experience the the you know more than anything it will be the attacks from capital and the capitalist class that radicalizes workers but even during that period of, of radicalization that there will be a process you know where each back and forth back and forth struggle between the two classes will deepen that radicalization between both classes hmm. and there will be defections and all the rest of it um um yeah you really have to, you know it's because it's obviously going to be a painful process it's it's difficult to appreciate but I, there does have to be some respect for like this as a science um if we're really going to grasp what's going on and how to relate to people because it's too it's too easy to dismiss everyone as an opportunist or a labor aristocrat um there is a process of proletarianization going on I, you know and i think the neoliberal period has been defined a lot by a kind of by a kind of um by like like a deproletarianization in a way which is why the left and the and the um and the revolutionary left have, have become smaller. I don't think you can just go, oh, the left is useless and that's why it's small. Like there's been a, mm. a material, ma there has to be a material reason. And I think that is, there's been a deproletarianization. Like in Britain, for example, you had the privatization of social housing and most workers signed up for that. Um, most workers didn't really oppose the, um, the denationalization or the reprivatization of industry because they were offered shares and that benefited them in the sh that benefited them financially in the short run so it, it seemed like the right <coughs> thing to do it seemed like the right thing to do for them at the time it's only now in the long run that they might look back and think oh that was that was well, you know the wrong, that was the wrong decision but I, and i think i think um it's too easy for people on the left sometimes to um think of uh neoliberalization in purely negative terms i mean obviously it's negative in the long term uh as a process mm. but there seems to me to be a number of different you know outcomes of neoliberalization uh, for example it's in the neoliberal era that we have the formation of increasingly large middle classes in places like china and places like India, you have like on a global level, neoliberalization led to an enormous increase in living standards for many, many people, not the majority, but many, many people uh, in the world, lifting millions out of poverty. Uh, while at the same time, for example, in the West, I think one of the tendencies of neoliberalization, and perhaps this may have, you know, this explains the ideological orientation of the left is that you have proletarianization of the educated classes Pr historically there was a pretty close correlation to between uh, level of education and your social and economic status uh, in society but today with sort of the mass marketing of uh, university degrees and education you know you 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 know you have a whole load of people who are highly educated but are you know functionally you know proletarianized as well so we have like you know for some elements of society particularly in the west neoliberalization has been like a pretty shitty experience you have all these downwardly mobile you know bourgeois petty bourgeois people but like in other parts of the world if you're in china and i think you mentioned that china is not as far along in the crisis capitalism for a very significant portion of the population has been a big success and so i guess what i'm trying to say is that looking at all this in moralistic terms like so much of the left does yeah uh, uh, doesn't help us because we also have to recognize the successes of capitalism in the sense that you know people aren't you know people are fleeing to many countries in the west because they want a taste of the fruits of you know being in a core capitalist country right 
Yeah, I mean that. What does Labour do at, historically? It looks for work. It looks for, <laughs> it looks for better paid work. Um, you know, that's been the general um, thing that, that that working class people have done, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, like you say, like you say, there is a, a progressive side to capitalism because it's progressing towards socialism, in my in my view, um, and you know it does increase our technical and productive capacity, albeit um, via these sharp, sh sharper and sharper crises um, in production. So yeah, it's it's progressive in in a, in in a sense and. It, Maybe you can say it does it in a re in a reactionary way, because it exploits labour. Um, you know, it proletarianises people. It um, goes through these big dips in production that cause all sorts of ugly outcomes, including war. Um, but yeah, it, it is progressing towards um, socialism ultimately, because you know, socialism is about abundance for all, right? Like abundant material um well for all or at least like the higher stage of of communism is co communism is and that's what we're working towards and you know that has been the trajectory through throughout capitalism's history it's like the marx was accused of like um saying that the working class is always impoverished but that that wasn't his argument his argument was that you know he he agreed that the 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 living standards of the working class tended to rise during capitalism. He just pointed out that it would it would um, collapse again because of this tendency to break down, which brings me on to the second part of the question which, about like is a how how bad is the crisis we're in right now? Politically, it's obviously very bad, and I think that's a largely a reflection of the economic uh, crisis, the depth of it um i have written in my book that we potentially are it, a, um, entering or at least approaching the final breakdown um and i i do that purely on the empirical evidence um obviously we discussed the rate of profit um falling ever closer to zero earlier um but there are a lot of other other things like have tended to fall in a killer trend towards zero or 700 years, which more or less covers the period of capitalism. Um, the, um, the life expectancy of the average um, top 500 coming from 60 years, about 50 years ago to about 15 years now. So like a big emerging uh, global corporation is only expected to live for 15 years like that's i think that's a pretty stark indication on the other back on the, the point about interest rates it usually takes a six percent cut in the interest rate um to end a recession and we've been stuck at zero pretty much since 2009 so like if 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 this um if the system can survive this crisis that we're about to enter or that we've already entered, because we're definitely in a recession now, um, like, can it go in deep into negative rates and survive? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, Japan and Italy went into deep negative rates at the end of World War II, and they both nearly, they both had a revolutionary uprisings at that point. Um, but we've never been at zero during peacetime. Like, obviously, peacetime is a bit of a, uh, a bit of a mis. Uh, well, Ted, we have uh, these days. You know, we have cheap food, cheap consumer products. We, we have <laughs> we. Well, we did, but I mean, yeah, I know the fuel bills are pretty pretty crazy, but you know, we're still. We're still not quite. At, it's uh, you know, it's we're not quite at the uh, moment where you know, in previous historical eras, you know, like these recessions would literally starve you know starve people mm. uh, to death. The capitalist state is in a very peaceful manner, very often just chucking people a couple of dollars to make sure that they can keep their Netflix on and their cheap food uh, coming out. But yes, how long is that a sustainable? 
policy is, uh, I mean, I suspect, you know, all this may give rise to a UBI. I think a UBI might be what the capitalists try and do because, you know, it's a political question at the end of the day. And, you know, bribing God, the, I, I have this vision where they give you like food, uh, food coup, coupons, which is just rations, but instead it's through Uber Eats. And then they give you like, uh, they give you like, you know, Amazon credit and stuff like that. And they just use this as a mechanism to, uh, you know, bail out large companies to, uh, mm. and then and, and pacify the population. But that's just my crazy UBI conspiracy theories. But, you know, we're coming up on the hour. Pascal, do you have any? Final no, questions no, or comments. I, I appreciated the conversation. It was a very important one, and I'm glad you got a chance to give us the uh, fully elucidate, elucidated uh, version of what Grossman's politics were about, and his, his economic vision as well. Yeah. Well, Ted, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, you know, have you got anything to plug, anything to tell our listeners about what they need to be, you know, checking you out? Obviously, you have your book. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll just plug the book quickly. Um it's available on zero books and Amazon and all the rest of them. If people can leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads, that would be helpful. Um, and yeah, just, just try and introduce people to Henrik Grossman that you can find all of, uh, a lot of my analysis free online. Um, if you go to my Twitter, which is at Grossmanite, um, and my li uh, link tree and all that stuff. So, yeah. So thanks a lot for having me on. Thank and, you. Uh, re really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And as we say on This Is Revolution, we are out.